Uh, hey. Uh, so a couple of days ago, I finally got round to actually deciding what I was going to talk about. Uh, I don't know how much information you have. I have. I I made a website like last night. It's not like something you missed. Uh, <laughs> See if I can remember. I think it's something like this. I just don't ask me why my institution wants to put an F there. Uh, I can't check this now because they made me turn my phone off because it would interfere with the. Am I. Do I need to do a sound check? Is there sound? Can you hear me? Does it work? Great. Okay. There you go. You, Google won't find it because I only put it up last night. And I don't think there's any link to it anywhere. So, uh, But I think that should work. Uh, this is just a list of resources. For, oh, can somebody confirm that it works? Maybe, maybe I'll give you 20 seconds. The website works. Thank you. Uh, so there there is. I, I made an example sheet. Uh, so there's some questions you can do. Uh, so what is this course? Uh, well, in 1992, I came to California for the first time in my life. And uh, I was a PhD student at the time of uh, Richard Taylor. So, his, so what's going to So what's going to happen... Uh, so basically, in 1992, in Caltech, Richard Taylor gave a Richard Taylor gave a course. Uh, he was some kid, right? No one had ever heard of him. He was a, <laughs> he was a some bright new some bright new lecturer. He just he just proved some uh, he just proved something about imaginary quadratic fields. Uh, he was a student of Wiles. Everyone had heard of Wiles. Uh, no one had heard of this guy, but he got an invitation to Caltech. I was one of his PhD students, so I came along. And he gave a really nice course. Uh, he gave a course. So ja it was January to April. And I had an absolute laugh. This was somehow the, the USA had just discovered kind of dance culture. I, I came out of the UK where things were going a bit stale somehow. But uh, in the USA, everyone was raving. It was great. So I spent the weekends raving in Los Angeles. And... Uh, Weekdays, trying to understand this course by Richard Taylor. Uh, and it was a really good course, and this was somehow, people weren't carrying laptops around all the time. Uh, nobody ever wrote it up. The only, I just have these handwritten notes, uh, which photocopy very poorly, because I wrote them in blue ink. That's something I learned. Something I learned over the years is I don't take notes in blue ink, because they don't photocopy very well. Uh, so anyway, I took some notes. They're great. They just exist in these kind of crappy note form. Uh, and often I find when PhD students would come and ask me questions later in life, they'd say, oh, where can I learn about this? I'd say, oh, Richard Taylor's notes are really good, but they're somehow in this completely inaccessible format. Like my handwritten notes, and that was it. So he gave this great course, and I'm going to summarize bits of this course. I'm going to modernize it, uh, because obviously a lot's happened uh, in the preceding 25 years. Uh, this course was mostly about GL2, but now we know a lot more about GLN. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, so I'm going to give a, I'll give an updated version. Uh, of this course. That's what I'm going to do. Because uh, the, the material still, you know, in my, in my opinion, anyway, the material still, uh, you know, still stands. And uh, as I say, a, lo a lot of it at the time, he, you know, he, he stated a lot of conjectures. He barely talked about GLN at all because our knowledge of GLN was fragmentary at the time. Uh, but he talked a lot about GL2. So nowadays we can talk more about GLN, but GL2 is still where many of the motivating examples come from. Uh, so this is going to be a course which, to a large extent, is about the group GL2. Uh, 
Uh, and I mean, I somehow, and I've chosen to give all the lectures myself, which is perhaps rather self-centered of me. Uh, but that's where we are. So we've got 25 hours of this. I probably won't do everything he's done. I won't do every, I mean, at the end, he spent a lot of time. Uh, he spent somehow the last third of the course talking about Ribbit's work on level lowering from modular forms, which was somehow incredibly important at the time, and a year later was used you know, crucially by Wiles to, and, and Taylor, of course, as well, to, uh, to prove Fermat's last theorem. So I'm not going to... Somehow Ribbit's work, although still historically important, it's not somehow at the forefront of things anymore, and I, I'm going to say less about that than Taylor did. Uh, but uh, the introductory material I'm going to kind of go through... So I was a first-year graduate student when I sat in this course. And I learned a huge amount, and uh, my plan is to try and teach you a, a huge amount as well. Uh, I don't really understand the system. My, I was somehow told to name a target audience, and my target audience was basically people who are now, you know, people who are in the same position I was in, I, you know, people who are first-year graduate students. But I've got no idea... My, my impression is that it's a little bit random who ends up coming. Uh, this is just an impression I get from reading Frank Caligari's blog, basically. I mean, it's not, I don't know if that's the most... <laughs> if anybody wants to see my partner, uh, you can go and watch a video of her on Frank Caligari's blog uh, for some reason. Uh, but uh, anyway, she's not here. She was going to come, but then Trump won, and she said, I'm not coming. So, <laughs> no, she's not she, so she's, <laughs> we were all going to have a family holiday here. And then she decided to boycott the place. Uh, so she's currently in Japan. Uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's enough about her. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm just trying to think. What? Oh, so before I, so I'm, I've got seven minutes before I'm supposed to start. So let me just talk about let's let's talk about. So what's what's the real plan here? So about the un, what's the goal? Uh, the goal uh, is that I is that you will learn stuff, right? Okay. This is this is the main goal, uh, and we have to we have to work to make sure that that happens, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to make you learn stuff by presenting. Uh, by presenting stuff at hopefully a reasonable rate, and then you in turn have to make sure that you're learning stuff by either engaging with the material or, if the material is much too easy for you, uh, engaging with something else. Uh, for example, uh, here's, here's ways you could learn. Here's examples of ways you can learn. Ways you can learn. Uh, so firstly, you can engage with the material. Uh, so as I say, I, I'm kind of writing it on the fly, based on this course by Taylor. I put Taylor's notes... This website contains a rather poor scan of my handwritten notes of this course. So feel free, if you want to see what's coming up next... Uh, Feel free to look at that course, and if you can face reading my, uh, my handwriting, uh, then great, you can read ahead. It, alternative, you want to sit and, uh, if you want to sit and type this stuff up, it's, I mean, I kind of feel that there's, a, there's almost a gap in the market for this stuff. This is, a, this is material. The, the reason I'm giving this course is because I find it difficult to point to a book and say, this book is quite a good place to learn this material. There's, somehow a, there's a wide array of things that Taylor explained very well, and uh, it's difficult to find one place where it's all covered. And I kind of, every now and then I kind of entertain the idea of maybe writing up myself and writing some book. Uh, but I, I'm just somehow busy. I have three kids. I have a lot to do. Uh, so you can engage with material, so you can attempt to understand it, or you could even, you, I mean, I just don't really know, right? You could, like, write it up, right? Write LaTeX. Uh, you know, write a LaTeX, whatever. Type the thing up. 
I have no idea whether people are interested in doing that. As I say, I think people would be interested to read it if you did. A huge amount of, I don't quite understand the system really, but uh, I had a lot of emails from people saying, I wanted, to be, I wanted to come to your course, but I couldn't come for various technical reasons. Uh, so there's a lot of people that are interested to know what, I, I guess things are going to get videoed, but what would you rather have, 25 hours of video or a kind of a 50-page LaTeX document? I mean, manifestly, people would rather have the 50-page LaTeX document. So if anyone wants to write this up, you should probably get to know each other and somehow interact with each other in some way that kids do. I mean, my, my students at my university, they're all, that somehow they all create some, in, in, within weeks, all the students are on some Facebook group and they're talking to each other about the lecture. Not, none of the lectures are in this, but people are passing ideas around or solutions to problem sheet. Uh, yeah, I don't really know what goes on in these places, but somehow students are capable of coming together and interacting with each other uh, because we have the internet. So if you want to get together in some way and talk about, like if one of you decides they're going to write up all the lectures, that's great, but if three of you independently decide you're going to write up all the lectures, then that's kind of inefficient, right? You should all somehow write up a third of the lectures each or something. Uh, so there's something, there's something you can do, right? So thirdly, you do the problems, right? Do the exercises. Uh, this is, there are, imp there are exercises both implicit and explicit in this course. Uh, and the way I learned the material was I kind of went to the, I went to the lectures I wrote the stuff down, and every now and then he would say, oh, this is an easy exercise, or he would say something I didn't quite understand, and I'd make a little marginal note, and then I would come back. If you actually look at my original photographs of these notes, they're covered in numbers, they're covered in red notes, it just says things like this. Uh, just integers kind of increasing from, a, from one to about 200. Uh, more than 200. And these are just, these are just notes. you don't have access to those notes. Uh, these are notes written on some se separate pieces of paper, which was me uh, basically solving all the implicit exercises in the material, filling in the gaps. Uh, so, there's, so there's fill in the gaps. Uh, but there's also, a, there's also a problem set, uh, an example sheet or something on the web. Uh, so my understanding is that, is that not all of you are supposed to be the target, or not all of you are the target audience. Some of you are here because of the nature of the system. Some of you are somehow fifth year graduate students with published papers who know all the material already. And you're here anyway. Uh, and somehow I can't really control who comes and who doesn't come. But, um, so you need to learn stuff too. Uh, so, so if it's all too easy, then you still need to find something to do so you get to learn stuff. Uh, so I'm not, I'm going to give the lectures, but there's, there's three other people here with me. Uh, so these are Rebecca Bellevin, my colleague in London. Uh, who I guess is an expert in periodic Hodge theory. I mean, and other things. Uh, there's Jackie Lang. Who's an expert in uh, periodic families of modular forms. And, um, and there's Illa Varma. Uh, she's an expert in lots of things, but in particular, uh, I guess she would know things about kind of local and global Langlands. Uh, I mean, all of these people, all of these people get dot, dot, dots because they're all, they're all good at lots of things. Uh, if... If the material is too easy for you, I would find one of these people and then just engage with them instead. Because I'm sure between them they know a vast amount more than you. 
about some stuff anyway. Uh, so go and talk to them. So I mean, these, these subjects will not be covered in great gory detail, uh, but they're, all, they're always kind of peripheral to the story. In fact, I should say, when I look at some of the, the mathematical things I've achieved so far, I guess one of the things I did was I constructed piadic families of automorphic representations uh, for you know, automorphic forms on some definite quaternion algebra. And I learned about automorphic forms on definite quaternion algebras in Taylor's course. So this course really changed my, uh, you know, somehow it shaped my, uh, my mathematical history. Uh, so there's some people. So if it's all too easy, you can do that. And you could also do, uh, there's a, you could, um, you could, you could consider, you could consider the project. Again, the project is for kind of, it's something that I've known can be, there's something, uh, this is some kind of R equals T thing. If, if you know a lot of this stuff already, uh, then, then you might want to consider, there, there's some, I have some question, this is, the, the, the project is, the project is explained on the website. Uh, and it's basically computing some explicit example of a, uh, this is somehow an abelian piadic Langlands, I mean, piadic Langlands correspondence. So, uh, although I'll say little about it somehow in this course, I'm going to talk about the classical Langlands correspondence, really, and my understanding of what it is. But nowadays, there's an emerging piadic Langlands correspondence uh, where you maybe want to match up piadic modular forms with piadic Galois representations or some such thing. Uh, and this is very much in its infancy now. In fact, some of the theory, the, the piadic Langlands correspondence now looks rather like the classical Langlands correspondence looked like in 1992 in the sense that we have some profound results for GL2 and somehow very little beyond that. Uh, so, if you want to go, I mean, I, this is, I don't know. There's, there's a theorem there waiting to be proved. I kind of suspect I know how to do it. I'll never get around to doing it. Uh, I suggested the problem to a master's student a few years ago, and they did about half of it, and wrote up a master's thesis, but never published it. Uh, I think I put that on the website as well. Uh, but anyway, there's some, you know, if you want to do a hard, if you want to do something difficult or write some little mini paper, and again, you probably should, just shouldn't launch into this by yourself. You maybe want to find a team of other people that also are interested in this project and become a team. Uh, so as I speak, I realize that this is somehow, I don't really know how to solve this problem. Uh, I, I kind of think we just need to make sure, we need to make sure that we can interact with each other. And I don't really know how to do that. Uh, we need to make sure that we can communicate. Uh, with each other. I mean, it's easy for me to communicate with you because I'm doing it right now. It's easy for you to communicate with me because you can just come and talk to me. But somehow I think you probably, we probably need to figure out some way that you can talk to each other. Uh, I mean, you can do this via me, I guess. Uh, but I kind of feel that there are better ways of doing it. You know, maybe via Facebook is a better way. I just don't. I know nothing about Facebook. All I know is I'm slightly scared of it. Uh, so maybe if somebody is interested in doing things like five, uh, maybe, maybe you should tell me. Or the other one as well, the writing up the, if you fancy, I mean, yeah, if you're interested in becoming part of a team, but, you know, some, if you're interested in forming a, a subset with some interesting properties, then I guess one way of doing that would be by talking to me. Uh, and I could perhaps write your name down and do, I don't know. We'll think of something. Uh, so I guess another thing I need to flag, uh, having talked to some people about how these summer schools go, here's a, a good way 
a good way that they can fail uh, is that let's, we, we need to make sure, we must make sure uh, we're using the time uh, profitably. Okay, it's like the blind, it's the blind leading the blind. I know, I've never run one of these summer schools before. Uh, all I know is that I was asked to make a schedule. I've got, you know, two and a half hours of material. I'm, I'm going to start on this now. I'm, I'm somehow ad-libbing because I felt that I, was, uh, I wasn't being paid yet. So, <laughs> so I felt I should wait. I'm going I'm to start now. Uh, but between two and three, pretty much every day, I have scheduled, I have basically scheduled, you can interact with Rebecca, Jackie, and Ella, right? That's, that's somehow... That's scheduled between two and three today. And between two and three today, I'm going to go back down the hill because I'm going to pay my rent. Uh, so I'm bi normally I will be around between nine and five. But today, I'm just running off. I won't be here. You're kind of on your own. There are these three smart people that you're supposed to be talking to. And if you decide that you'll just rather be sitting around outside, you have to somehow be absolutely clear. That, I mean, we need to make sure that people's times are not being wasted, right? As long as, all the, as long as all these people are talking to somebody and people are trying to, you know, as long as people are teaching people stuff and people are learning stuff, then that's fine. Uh, but if things don't seem to work and no one quite knows what they're doing, then that means something's gone wrong and the way to deal with that is not just to let it stay wrong for two weeks and then at the end complain that it wasn't very good. We kind of need to fix it quick. Uh, so as I say, I'm going to disappear. After my two lectures, I'm going to clear off down the hill, I'm going to pay somebody some money, and then I'm going to come back for 4pm. Uh, but uh, if somehow, if people have got suggestions as to what to do between 2 and 3, uh, then they should come and talk to me sooner rather than later. So, I've come thousands of miles to give these courses, to, to give this stuff, and I, I really want it to work, so if, if, if there are problems, then we need to fix them. And because uh, there's no point me, I could be on holiday in Japan with my children. There's no point uh, me wasting my time here if, if things aren't going well. So let's make sure that things go well. So, right, so, right, talk to me, right? You can talk to me about anything. Uh, okay, I'm going to try and teach you some stuff now. Uh, I don't know when I'm stopping. Is it 10.45? So let's start then. Uh, okay, there's a clock back there. So I'm going to speak for an hour and five minutes, then we'll have a break. So I guess our story begins uh, with the following... Uh, with the following observation. So the story begins... with a Dirichlet character uh, with some integer n an integer at least one so, some people write I, I'm terrified of this that I, I don't like that symbol at all because it's not clear to me whether zero is in it or not so Richard Taylor a man from whom I've learned a lot pointed out that if you use this then everyone can guess what that means so n is an integer at least one uh, and Kai's a Dirichlet character. Kai, from Z mod N Z to Z mod N Z star. It was in Berkeley where I learned to say Z. I, should, I was a postdoc here for two, for two years down the hill. I had a really good time. Uh, spent a lot of time hanging out with Robert Coleman. Now, sadly, no longer with us. Uh, an incredible guy. So, story begins with an interior at least one, and Kai, a Dirichlet character. Uh, by which I mean a group homomorphism. Uh, so attached to chi, we get a representation. Uh, so I'm going to... This is... 
I should say that the next hour or so, or at least half an hour, I don't know how long it's going to take, but at least the next half an hour or so is supposed to be some overview. Uh, and then we're going to go back. We're going to go back, we're going to go back later and uh, do some definitions more carefully and uh, go over things more carefully. So, but now we're going to have an overview. So Kai is going to be a Dirichlet character, then, uh, then attached to Kai. Is a Galois representation is rho chi, uh, and this looks very fancy. It goes from gal q bar over q uh, to gl to gl one of c. So this is an infinite Galois group. I'm going to say something about infinite Galois groups later. Uh, but uh, as I say, in this introduction, I don't really want to worry too much about how infinite Galois theory works. Uh, so how does this work? Uh, the idea is that gal q bar over q surjects onto gal q zeta n over q, uh, where this is a primitive nth root of unity. Uh, and this is canonically isomorphic to z mod nz star. Oh dear, I'm afraid I'm going to spend half the time saying z and half the time saying z. Uh, and because of this canonical isomorphism, there's some chi here. So there it is. Uh, so I learned in my undergraduate, I learned this isomorphism in my undergraduate Gower theory class. And, and maybe I should say now that uh, I this equals, I mean, you know this symbol is isomorphic to uh, uh, sort of two lines with a wavy line on top. But uh, I haven't written that. I've written equals. Uh, maybe I'll say that uh, this equals yeah, denotes uh, canonical, you know, canonical isomorphism. In this context. Uh, so you see what's happening here is that uh, uh, I, I'm going to send some n here to, this is where the work is, it's not so clear. Given a random integer prime to capital N, uh, I'm, going to send, I'm going to send that integer to some element of this Gower group that sends this nth root of unity to its nth power. But one has to check that such a thing exists and it's well defined and it's independent of all choices and blah, blah, blah. So there's some exercises. Uh, so these things are not just isomorphic, they're canonically isomorphic. And so that means attached to chi is this canonical rho chi. Uh, so that's that. And somehow that goes back to the arc. Uh, and then the next step... Maybe there's... Well, I guess I'm skipping some class field theory in the abelian part of the story. Uh, but there's a GL2 version. Uh, next, there's a GL2 story. And the GL2, the GL2 variant of this looks rather different. So it's rather funny. So it looks like this. Let's say, uh, let's say I've got a modular form. So again, I'll, later on, I'll briefly whiz through the definitions of modular forms. I'll tell you the things you need to know. Uh, let's say F is a cuspidal modular form. Oops. And let's say it's an eigenform for the Hecker operators. P, that's what these things are called. Uh, so F is a modular form, and TP is some map from the space of modular forms to itself, and F is going to be an, eigen, an eigenvector for all of these TPs. Uh, so let's say, uh, let's say, let's say TP of F is lambda P of F. There we are, lambda P. The theory of modular forms is some complex analytic theory, right? Uh, lambda p 
is going to be some complex number. Uh, then it turns out then the field that the subfield of C generated by all these eigenvalues generated by the lambda p. So on the face of it, this looks like some arbitrary, possibly infinitely generated subfield. Uh, but it turns out that this is a number field. EF. So it's a number field that comes equipped with an embedding into the complex numbers, but it has finite degree over Q. Uh, And uh, after an observation of Serre uh, in the in the sixties, uh, there was some intensive work by Deline uh, using the whole m m as then modern machinery of algebraic geometry. So, uh, so a theorem of Deline. So it turns out if uh, let's say. If let's choose a if L is a prime number, so L is a prime number, and I've got some number field lying around, so EF and and uh, and lambda and lambda dividing L is a place of EF is a prime of EF, which I mean of course a non-zero prime idea of the ring of integers of EF. Uh, then, following a suggestion of Serre, uh, Deline proved some kind of two dimensional variant of this Rho Chi story. Uh, Deline constructed rho f, and it's going to go from this gal bar group of gal q bar over q to GL2 of e lambda bar. So I've, got, I've called it ef, not e, haven't I? So it's ef completed at lambda, take an algebraic closure. Uh, so this is supposed to be formally kind of similar to this thing here. Uh, here are some salient differences. There's a number one, and there's a number two. This is kind of a, uh, I don't know. I guess one isn't equal to two. That's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, here we have the complex numbers, and here we have some sort of L-adic numbers. So the fact that these are somehow two instances of the same story must somehow be a lie. And I believed that lie for many years. Uh, and it was only relatively recently that I somehow finally managed to disentangle uh, what was going on. So I think at the time, Taylor was trying to argue that these constructions were two, st two parts of a general phenomenon. But I could never quite understand how this could be true uh, if this was a complex representation and this was an l adic representation. Uh, I now understand that much better. And it's maybe one of the things I'm going to try and explain to you over the next two weeks. Uh, so Deline constructed this representation. This is row f is somehow attached to f in some way, right? Row f. In some way. Uh, well, let me say a little bit more about this then. So 
Let me say, let me say more about this. Uh, so as I say, I'm going to whiz through the theory of modular forms kind of more carefully later, but uh, if I have some modular form, uh, if I've got some modular form, which is an eigenform for these Hecker operators, uh, I guess modular forms, so F is some modular form. And therefore, F has, uh, F has a level N has a weight K. These are all integers at least one. And it has a character uh, Chi, which is a Dirichlet character of level N. So my modular form has a level and a weight and a character. And uh, you see, with the, with the Dirichlet character, I just showed you how to, a really natural way of attaching a representation to that Dirichlet character. But here we're going to have to do some work. Uh, I mean, Deline's construction uses a lot of etal cohomology. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I can tell you now, so I can now, I now have enough notation to tell you about the relationship between row f and f. Uh, so it turns out that uh, that row f is unramified. As I say, I'll come back to all this later and explain things more carefully, but this is unramified outside n times l. So n, the uh, level of the form, and l, the prime number. We're doing L-adic representations. Uh, you see that L, there was no analog of L in the GL1 story, so you know there's something slightly fishy going on. Uh, and if P is prime, if P is prime, P doesn't divide N times L, uh, then rho F is unramified at P, so one can make sense of a, uh, then rho F of a Frobenius at P. So this is now a two by two matrix. Uh, and I'll tell you its characteristic polynomial as char poly uh, x squared minus lambda p x plus p to the k minus 1 times chi of p. Chi of p is OK. p doesn't divide n times l, so it doesn't divide n, so chi of p is non zero. Uh, so there you go. Uh, So I've told you what the uh, I've told you the basically I've told you the trace of this representation lambda p on a Frobenius element at p, and it turns out that these uh, these Frobenius elements or Frobenius conjugacy classes are dense in this Galois group. I mean, I mean, there's the, the, by the Chebotarev density. Let me just say this by Chebotarev. By the Chebotar of density theorem, uh, uh, there's at most one row f with this property. Well, there are, uh, there's at most one semi simple row f with this property. Uh, and Deline's theorem is that there's the least one. So there you go. So there's some there's some black box. Uh, so this was done in the 70s, I guess, the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, just a word on so just a word on Deline's construction. You've got to remember that, that it's a, like, put, in a historical context, this is kind of a very strange thing. Nowadays, n-dimensional L-adic representations of Gower groups kind of fall out the sky because we've somehow realized that uh, these are the things we should be thinking about. Uh, but at the time, I think these were far less, these were far less common. In fact, I think modular forms were regarded as deep suspicion by most number theorists. That's the impression I get. 
they weren't really number theoretic objects at all. They were objects in harmonic analysis. Uh, some of our number theorists were thinking about class numbers and things like this. The USL were main conjecture. Uh, none of this fancy modular form stuff. So it was kind of funny that, I mean, it took, this, was a, this was at a time when modular forms weren't really of great importance to number theorists, but it somehow marked the beginning of a, you know, of a, of a huge impact that they had in the area. Uh, so let me just say a word on Deline's construction. Uh, how does he find a two-dimensional Galois represent a two-dimensional l adic representation of a Galois group? Uh, Deline. Deline finds this Galois representation rho f. Uh, well, Deline constructs rho f using something which was at the time considered a very fancy new thing called letal cohomology. Uh, and in this generality, he would construct it uh, you know, with non-trivial coefficients. Uh, so nowadays, one would wonder whether this sort of thing comes from a motive, and uh, etal cohomology gives you motives, but you would normally take etal cohomology with trivial coefficients. Uh, so there's some issue here about constructing etal cohomology. You have some non-trivial analytic sheaf uh, on the modular curve, uh, and then let, but somehow Deline also manages to realize, and then. Uh, and then using a tal cohomology, trivial coefficients on some appropriate power uh, of some universal elliptic curve. So Deline kind of got halfway to, a, to proving that these were really motivic, for those of you that know what motives are. And then later on, Tony Scholl proved these things really were motivic. Uh, I should probably also say, so uh, giving this sketch has reminded me that actually this only works for k at least two. Uh, so this is all. This is all. This is all for k at least two. For k is one. That historically had to wait for a few more years. Uh, is done by uh, Deline and Sarah. I think that was 1974. I can't remember. Might be a bit later. So, using some then rather fancy mathematics, uh, Deline attached a two dimensional representation to a modular form. And the point, I'm trying to argue that formally that's a bit like attaching a one dimensional representation to a Dirichlet character. Uh, So before I go on, just let me flag some. Uh, let me flag some issues. Uh, here's some so questions that arise from Deline's construction. So given this modular form, we have this two-dimensional representation of a Galois group that's, that's, that's somehow fallen out of the sky. And I've told you what it looks like uh, at an unramified prime. If P divides n times L, uh, what does rho f look like? locally at P. Uh, so this has some formal meaning that uh, we're going to talk about later. This global Galois group contains a local Galois group. The absolute Galois group of QP is embedded in this thing canonically up to some conjugation. And one could restrict our local 
uh, we, one could restrict our global gamma representation to this local situation and ask what the corresponding local gamma representation is. And you see, if you, if you know this stuff already, what you'll know is what I've written here, uh, I've told you that the local gamma representation, if P doesn't divide N times L, the local gamma representation is unramified. And I've told you the char poly of Frobenius, so I've basically told you essentially the complete local behavior of this gamma representation for P a good prime. There's a semi-simplicity issue, which I think is still unresolved uh, because we can't prove the Tate conjecture. But modulo that, you see, if I tell you the characteristic polynomial of a matrix, I haven't quite told you the matrix up to conjugation because if it's got repeated eigenvalues, there's some semi-simplicity that one has to worry about. Uh, that I think, I think might still be unresolved. But anyway, uh, if P does divide N times L, then the Gower representation will typically be ramified. Uh, and we can't get away with, we can't get away with talking about Roa for frog P. So this is, what, this is beginning to become understood now. What does Ryf look like locally at P? So it turns out there's two different, there's two different answers. So uh, case one, uh, P divides N, uh, P not equal to L. Okay. Uh, then the answer is given by uh, by one of the main things that I'm going to be explaining to you in the next, uh, in the next few days. Uh, it's going to be given by the local Langlands conjectures, which are theorems for GL2 uh, of QP. And in fact, nowadays, are theorems for GLN of any local field. Uh, so the answer is given by the local Langlands correspondence, the so-called. So the local Langlands correspondence, if you pick up some book, it's some assertion about uh, relating possibly infinite dimensional representations of groups like GLN of QP uh, to things called Vedalene representations, uh, which are representations of things that are a bit like Gower groups, but not quite Gower groups. And there's some funny capital N that is quite mysterious the first time you read it. Uh, but even if you know what the statement of the local Langlands correspondence is, I don't think it's at all clear uh, what this has to do with modular forms. So that's one of the things I'm going to explain. Uh, I'm going to explain this, hopefully this week. Uh, so there's case one, and then case two is that P equals L. P equals L. And now we have a p-adic representation of a p-adic group. Well, a p-adic representation of a p-adic Gower group. Uh, so then the story, uh, then we should use some kind of p-adic local Langlands correspondence. somehow, whatever that is. Uh, and so it turns out that this is kind of the, almost the boundary of our knowledge in some sense, I guess. Wow. I guess it depends on how you interpret what I've written. But let me just make a comment that the Piadic local Langlands correspondence is a theorem for GL2 of QP. But it's not a theorem for GL3 or GLN yet. And in fact, in some sense, we don't even know what the question is. Uh, so there we go. So if you're interested in that, you can ask Rebecca. She'll know something. So there's that. Uh, and in Taylor's original course, uh, he then said something about a variant and then went on to other things. I guess maybe I'll just say 
Wow. Yeah, yeah, maybe I will mention this. So there's an easier variant. Uh, easier variant. Instead of asking for row f, uh, for row f, uh, we could instead ask for its mod L reduction. If we're going to row f bar. Uh, so if we have row f, we can reduce it mod L, basically. So row f bar now goes from gal q bar over q to, uh, to gl2 of, let's say, fl bar. There. So I'll identify fl bar with the residue field. The residue field of e lambda bar at, at, uh, at lambda. So you see, given Deline's L addict representation, you can reduce it mod L and get some mod L representation. And actually, this is much easier to construct uh, because there are tricks. Uh, you can reduce to weight 2 and then use abelian varieties. You can find rho f bar in the L torsion of abelian variety. Uh, so this is easier to construct. I mean, if you have rho f, you can get rho f bar. But what I'm saying is if, you, if, rho, f, if rho f is too difficult because you don't know what a tal cohomology is, you can still have rho f bar because uh, you, you can build it in the L torsion of an abelian variety. So rho f bar lives in the L torsion of an appropriate abelian variety. So, as I say, this is supposed to be some overview of uh, where this course is going. So, when I start actually teaching the course properly, uh, we're going to have more details, and I'm not going to be throwing around fancy words without let or hindrance. Uh, so, there you go. There's row F and there's row F bar. Uh, so, now let me tell you some things that Taylor didn't say, because he hadn't proved them yet. Uh, So the question here, the question Taylor asked at the time, uh, so a one and two uh, are rho chi and rho f, somehow special cases of a general story. Uh, Uh, and, the, of course, the answer is yeah, kind of, but um, it's somehow quite difficult to imagine at the time. It's somehow quite difficult to imagine if you're me, for example, in 1992, then you know the definition of a Dirichlet character, and you know the definition of a modular form, and they look completely different. It's somehow very difficult to imagine uh, how to unify them. Uh, but if I tell you... If I tell you a theorem that Taylor proved with others 20 years after his course, uh, then we'll, we'll see the clue. So here's a, here's a theorem of Michael Harris, Kai Wen Lan, Richard Taylor, and Jack Thorne. From 2013. Uh, and I guess also shortly afterwards it was a, uh, I think the results were reproved by Schultzer using some of this uh, perfectoid magic about which I'm unfortunately going to say very little in this course. Uh, they proved the following thing. So let me, I mean, I'm just going to have to get very technical now. So let's, now let's, so instead of the rational numbers, I'm going to let E be some, uh, E be a totally real 
or CM number field. So a totally real number field is one such that all maps from E to the complexes have image in the reals. A CM number field is a totally imaginary extension of a totally real field. Uh, and pi, a cuspidal automorphic representation, of GLN of the Adels of E. I'm going to spend a lot of time explaining what the words on that line mean in this course. So it doesn't matter if you don't know now, but I am going to tell you what a cuspidal automorphic representation is. I'm not going to tell you what an automorphic representation is, because I don't actually know. But I do know what a cuspidal automorphic representation is. So I will, I'll stick to that. Uh, as an exercise, you can try and figure out what an automorphic representation is, and then you can tell me. That would be great. Uh, so, so assume that uh, assume that uh, pi infinity is cohomological. So this is a this is an assertion about the weight of pi. Uh, so this is some technical this is some technical assumption. You see, when we figure out what automorphic representations are, we'll learn to our horror that they're rather analytic objects. Uh, a general automorphic representation really seems to have very little to do with number theory at all. Uh, there are things. I mean, there are differential equations involved. There are kind of elliptic partial differential equations that these things are supposed to be solutions to, or elements of these things. Uh, and this is some assertion about the, the kind of differential equations that certain forms in this, uh, that certain elements in this representation uh, obey. So assume that pi infinity is somehow cohomological, whatever that means. This is some. This is an algebraicity assumption. Uh, but it's quite a strong one. It's a strong, if you like. I don't know. This says something. This is some assertion about differential equations. Uh, Well, I mean, then there exists some representation rho pi from gal, gal e bar over e to uh, gln of ql bar. Uh, you see, this is an n now. We've gone from 1 to 2 to general n. There's just a rho pi from gal e bar over e to GLN of QL bar attached to pi in some way. Attached to pi in some canonical way. Uh, well, so, I mean, this is the analog of a uh, of giving the char poly of rho f of frog p. So it's the same story here. Basically, if p is some prime for which everything is unramified, um, if p doesn't divide anything in sight, then, uh, uh, then rho pi will be unramified at p. And I'll tell you what rho pi of a Frobenius at p is. Uh, I'll tell you it's characteristic polynomial. It's some explicit polynomial coming from some theory of unramified local representations. So there's some story. Uh, so this is 2013. And I guess more recently, there's this 10 author paper. What is the 10 author paper? You know about the 10 author paper? Do you all read Frank Caligari's blog? There's... Uh, so yeah, this isn't quite the end of the story. I don't know. Anyway, uh, maybe yeah.
Well, I don't know, maybe, actually, maybe... For, actually, maybe the ten author paper's about something else. Uh, so anyway, so what have we just seen? So as I say, we'll, I'll, maybe, I'll maybe explain a precise statement of this theorem later. So more details later. So what I've given you is three examples, you know, some of which you may or may not have been able to follow to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, but what we've seen so far, uh, we've seen three instances of some construction where you have some kind of algebraic object, uh, or possibly, or possibly even, yeah, maybe it's time to get a new lump. So what have we just seen? Given, given an algebraic or an analytic gadget, so it was chi or f or pi, uh, given one of these gadgets, there was some kind of construction that uh, might involve some very profound mathematics. I mean, certainly in this case. Uh, the, the theorems like this have, do go back to the 1990s uh, with some duality. If you imagine that pi is self... Let me, let, let me just informally tell you what the story is. Basically, how do you construct... How do you construct... This is sort of a meta-theorem that any Galois representation uh, you can think of at the end of the day has probably come from an et al. cohomology group. Somehow, people might argue that et al. cohomology... Uh, and perhaps piadic deformations of et al. cohomology are the only ways of constructing such complex objects. Uh, so this machinery uses et al. cohomology, and you want to normally take the et al. cohomology of an algebraic variety defined over a number field. And uh, if, you have some, if you have some sort of duality assumption here, then you can use some theory of Shimura varieties and look at the cohomology of Shimura varieties to prove this. But there's no duality assumption anymore. I mean, this is, this is some very technical point, but the reason this is such a great theorem is that pi is not assumed to be essentially self-dual in any way at all. And so one has to use clever piadic methods to prove this. So there's a huge amount of mathematics goes into it. And in particular, you know, you understand it all in Schultz, with Schultz's viewpoint. You're seeing a huge amount of modern machinery going in to prove these difficult theorems. So this is kind of technical... you know, technical machinery. Uh, and then we land here, representations of Galois groups. So we've seen three instances of this now. We have some object that doesn't, I mean, yeah. We have some object, and it turns out that this is this object can somehow be, uh, yeah, I mean, these, these objects are motivic in some way. People don't really know what a motive is, but uh, these objects are motivic, so they have some kind of motivic cohomology, which might be uh, some representation of the, I mean, I don't know. They have et al. cohomology. I'm, this, is, this is the story we've seen. Uh, and the last thing I want to do in this introduction uh, is to ask another question about this picture, which is to try and classify the image. Uh, so here's a big question about which I've said nothing so far. Here's an interesting question then. Uh, can we classify the image? So in other words, i.e., so the way I've presented the material so far, the fundamental object we started with was a Dirichlet character or a modular form or a cuspid automorphic representation. Uh, and attached to one of these gadgets 
uh, we had a representation of a Galois group. So now let's say, what about if we go the other way? Now let's say, let's say I start with rho from some Galois group to GLN of some field. You see, Neva, I've got to be a little bit vague because the field was the complex number, so one, and it's somehow QL bar or FL bar in these other stories. It's not immediately clear. I was, when I was your age, I was always very confused about which fields exactly we should be thinking about here. So let's say I've got a representation from a Galois group to GLN of a field. Then the question is, uh, does it, is it born in this way? Is rho, is rho isomorphic? Uh, to a representation coming from a, coming from the left hand side, you know, from, coming from algebra or whatever, uh, an algebraic or analytic gadget. So there. Uh, so this is a question about which I've said nothing yet. Uh, so now I'm going to get back to the beginning. And we're, going to, and we're going to see if we can answer this question in any case. Uh, so let's start with the one-dimensional story. So let's do the one-dimensional case. Uh, let's say uh, let's say k over q is a finite Galois extension and let's say I've got a one-dimensional representation of it and rho goes from gal k over q this is now a finite group. And let's say I've got a one-dimensional representation of this. GL1 of C. Uh. So the question is, is when can I expect that row uh, to be isomorphic to a, a row chi with chi a Dirichlet character? So here's a quick, you know, is rho, is rho isomorphic to rho chi? for chi Dirichlet character. There's a question. Uh, so let's try and figure out what that question means. Well, rho is a representation. I guess any group homomorphism uh, factors as a surjection followed by an injection. And uh, Galois theory is quite good when it comes to surjections. Uh, so we can replace uh, by replacing K by a subfield if necessary. We can assume that rho is injective because rho will surject down to gal L over Q for some random number field L and then gal L over Q will inject into GL1 of C. Uh, so we can assume rho goes from gal K over Q into C star is injective. And hence, uh, in particular, because C star is an abelian group, remark, this trick is never going to work in any other case. C star is an abelian group, uh, so K over Q, hence K uh, over Q is an abelian extension. Hence, gal K over Q is abelian. Hmm. Uh, so now, the question we're asking is, is rho isomorphic to rho chi for chi Dirichlet character? So let's remind ourselves of this, uh, what rho chi looks like. 
So, Rho Chi looks like this. Uh, so, if I've got Chi from Z mod NZ star to C star, uh, so this is gal Q zeta n over Q. Uh, and this is rho chi. And so we can do the same trick with rho chi. Uh, so I guess rho chi gives rise to gal L over Q injecting, uh, let me still call it rho chi, into C star. Uh, for some L. L that's now going to live in Q zeta n. There. So we've got a random representation of gal k over Q, which gives, us, which gives rise to some random abelian extension of the rational numbers. But unfortunately, the representations coming from Dirichlet characters all give us injective representations of Galois groups uh, but the Galois groups are of a special kind. They're Gal L over Q, where L must be a subfield of a cyclotomic field. So we run into the following question then. Uh, the question basically becomes, this field K, can I realize it as a subfield of, the cyclo of a cyclotomic field? So the question becomes, Uh, it's not representation theoretic at all now. The question becomes the following. If I've got K is a number field, Galois over Q, with a Belian Galois group, uh, I guess we could do cyclic Galois group, uh, but let's just stick with a Belian. With a Belian Galois group, Uh, does there exist some natural number n such that such that k lives in q zeta n? You see, what's clear is that the converse is true, right? If I've got any subfield of q zeta n, uh, then it's Galois over q, and the Galois group is abelian. Uh, but conversely, if I have an abelian Galois group, uh, is that explained by the fact that my number field was a subfield of Q zeta n? So this is true, uh, but this is some work, right? I'm just trying to highlight where the work is. And what we see here uh, is that this, this must be some work because it has a name, right? So the answer is yes. And it's, that's called the chronic of Weber theorem, right? The history is slightly complicated, I think. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, there's the chronic of Weber theorem. Uh, so in particular, so the chronic of Weber theorem is now regarded as some explicit special case of global class field theory, right? Uh, so this is, at the time it was called the chronic of Weber theorem, but nowadays, nowadays it's called an explicit case of, uh, of global glass field theory. Uh, so, We've classified the image. Is it still there? Yeah, look, maybe. Yeah. Can we classify the image? So let's say I've got a one-dimensional representation uh, from gal cube over Q to GL1 of the complexes. Is it isomorphic to the representation coming from chi for some chi? The answer is always yes. So therefore, for all, for all rho, gal cube over Q, whatever, to, uh, to GL1 of C, Continu I mean, continuous. This is just some, 
crazy way of saying that there's an image of finite order. Uh, there exists some chi from z by nz star to c star, such that rho is isomorphic to rho of chi. So as I say, this is, we didn't get this for free, we got this from the Kronecker-Weber theorem. It's a reinterpretation of the Kronecker-Weber theorem. So that's the answer for GL1. Uh, the answer is the image is everything and the proof is class field theory. So for GL2, the story is much more interesting. Uh, so what about the GL2 case? Uh, so let me tell you some fancy words. Uh, so here's the GL2 story. If I have some modular form, if f is a cuspidal modular eigenform as before, as before, uh, then remember there's a Galois representation rho f, then rho f has the following properties. Uh, so one, it's irreducible. It's absolutely, absolutely irreducible. Uh, and secondly, there's a parity condition. Rho f is odd. Uh, so I've been throwing around these kind of crazy infinite Galois groups like there's no tomorrow. And I can't really think of a single element of these Galois groups in some sense, apart from complex conjugation. Uh, if I embed Q bar into the complexes, then complex conjugation is an automorphism of Q bar. Uh, and it has order two, so rho f is odd, i.e. the determinant of rho f of complex conjugation. This is an element of order two in this Galois group. Uh, so determinant of rho f is a one-dimensional representation. What does it do to an element of order two? It will either send it to plus one or minus one. So odd means it sends it to minus one. So this, this representation I mentioned earlier, coming from this profound theorem of Deligne, Uh, I guess it was Rivet that proved rho f was absolutely irreducible. Uh, the guy down the hill. So it's absolutely irreducible. It's odd, which means determinant of rho of complex conjugation is minus one. And there's some other things as well. Uh, and thirdly, rho f is, uh, I don't know what to call it, People call it geometric, which is a terrible name for it. Uh, I can't think of a good. I can't think of a better name. Um, has the following properties. Well, rho f is unramified. Outside a finite set of primes. Uh, and it has some Piadic Hodge theory. And rho f is potentially semi stable. At P. Sorry, at, at L. Uh, uh, whatever. So rho f is a. Maybe I should say rho f is now going from gal q bar over q to gl2 of, let's just call it ql bar. So this is something that I won't be explaining in this course. This is a, this is a condition in periodic Hodge theory. I don't think Deligne proved that. I think the notion of potentially semi-stable didn't even exist when Deligne constructed his representations. But uh, as life goes on, we get wiser. And uh, 
So here's some random condition. So these, these things put together, it turns out etal cohomology always has these properties. Uh, and etal cohomology is some geometric cohomology theory. So some people, some people summarize three as saying that rho f is geometric. Uh, but that's somehow a terrible notation, really, because uh, that's the sort of thing you want to prove. Uh, you want to prove that if a representation has these properties, then it comes from geometry. So if you, call, if you define that to be geometric, which people do, then the conjecture is that if you're geometric, you come from geometry, which is somehow not a very clever, I mean, it doesn't sound so clever. So I want to call this algebraic or something. And I'll say that algebraic things come from geometry. But algebraic is also a heavily overused word, so I'm reluctant to give condition three a name at all. Uh, is that everything? I've got absolutely irreducible, odd, and these local conditions here. So you see, this is the strategy. First of all, you write down all the things you can think of, all the properties of rho if you can think of, and then you make the conjecture. Uh, So in around 1990, in the early 1990s, Fonten and Mazer asked if this was a, asked if the converse is true. Asked if rho, uh, whatever, from gal q bar over q to gl2 of ql bar satisfies uh, satisfies 1 to 3 Then was row isomorphic to row f, some f. And in fact, there were variants of this as well. Uh, like in many cases, uh, they, were, they were keen to even drop condition two and see if they could uh, deduce it from the other conditions. So that became known as the fontaine mazer conjecture, and there's also a fontaine mazer conjecture for GLN. Uh, but... Uh, this is kind of a very explicit thing. Uh, now this is almost known. Uh, this conjecture is now basically known. Uh, I don't quite know what's going on here with this story because the, I knew the references I have for this one of them is not published, and I don't know why. Does anyone, do you know any gossip? Why is Emerton's paper from 2011 still a preprint? Uh, I wonder if he's decided not to publish. Two pe basically, Emerton and Kissin proved essentially all of this independently around five years ago. Uh, so, so this conjecture is basically known due to, uh, uh, by work of, of Emerton and Kissin. So uh, Kissin, this is published, local global, uh, no, sorry, the fontaine Mazer conjecture for GL2. And independently, Emerton. So, in fact, neither of them prove absolutely everything, but both of them prove kind of like 99% of everything. They, they prove things subject to minor technical conditions that I'm not going to go into because, uh, I mean, they shouldn't be there and they'll be removed one day. But uh, the, the big list of technical conditions is slightly different in Kissing and Emerton's thing, so both papers still have worth. You know, both, each paper covers cases that the other paper doesn't cover. But for some reason, Emerton's work is not published. 
yet. Uh, might just be because he's busy, I don't know. So local global compatibility. Uh, in the Pierre Langlands program. In the in the Pierre Langlands program for GL2. I mean, who cares if it's published or not? It's on his website. You can go away and read it. Uh, so these are these are all sort of around, I guess, around both both around 2012 or so. I forget when. Uh, but this all came out of people trying to understand Piatic Local Langlands for GL2, QP. So, in the three minutes I have left, I'll just... Uh, well, maybe I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do the, in the GLN case. Uh, I'm still talking about conv I'm talking about given rho. Does it come from F? So the G does does the Harris Lan. Uh, so does rho from gal from whatever gal F bar over F to well, I called it E, didn't I? Gal E bar over E to GLN of QL bar. Uh, the GLN case, the question is, is rho plus, you know, plus some assumptions? Uh, does that imply that rho is isomorphic to rho pi, as in, as in Harris, Land, Taylor, Thorne? Uh, and I guess maybe... The state of the art here is maybe BLGGT. So Barnet Lamb. Uh, BLGGT Garrity, no, G Garrity Taylor. Garrity, now works for Facebook, I believe. Uh, Barnet Lamb, G Garrity Taylor. Uh, so there's maybe. The state of the art here. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, so they prove something non-trivial. But I, I'm not going to state what they do because they have to. There's, they could. I mean, they have to assume some very technical Piatic Hodge theory stuff that I don't really want to get into at all. So there's the state of the art. Prove this in many cases. So prove this. Prove this in many cases. Uh, and I guess more generally, uh, we have the 10 author paper. So see also the 10 author paper. So see also. So if you follow Frank Caligari's blog. then you can see pretty much everything that 99% uh, of people can access about the 10 author paper. So the, but I guess Barnett, Lamb, G. Garrity, Taylor, E is a totally real field, and this paper is a CM field. Uh, so there's no preprint yet. There's just rumors on a blog. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so it got to this, and someone is telling you about blog rumors in a math talk. Uh, but it, basically, the rumor is that in many cases, the answer is yes. Uh, so I have a little break now, but uh, this is somehow, you know, the next talk won't be anything like this, right? This is some kind of overview of the kind of questions that we'll be interested in. And uh, I'm going so, to say much more details about things, in particular, the GL2 case over the next two weeks. Uh, I'm going to get a coffee. Please feel free to talk to me. Uh, I'm not remotely scary. <laughs> and I'll see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>